You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne Tha God. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building, author Janet Mock. Yep. Good morning. How Good are morning. you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet She's you. She's also a New York Times bestselling author, Charlamagne. Just so you know, because he is as well. I know. He, he was on for weeks and weeks. There's a difference. Eight okay. weeks in a row, but who's counting? Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's major. That's hard to do. Thank mm -hmm. you. You got to talk to the microphone. Oh. There we go. Very right, and do. so now you have this new book, Surpre Surpassing Certainty, which mm -hmm. is, by the way, in my book club right now. Which Thank I've you, been Angela. Reading. So let's get into some of Janet Mock's background. And uh, for you as a youth, because you're very honest about a lot of things that have happened in your life mm -hmm. and how you grew up. Um, so let's, you know, get into what made you feel like this is your second book. What made you feel like you had to reveal your whole journey and share mm -hmm. with people? Well, I think that when I was growing up, I didn't really have images of folk like me who were doing the work that I wanted to do. Ever since I was very young, I wanted to work in popular culture. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a journalist. And I didn't really have an example of a young black trans woman doing that work in the mm -hmm. world. Because so often a lot of the women that I grew up with were kind of just on the streets um, they didn't have that many resources, and so it was just harder to get to college, to get through high school, mm -hmm. to be able to get a master's degree and move to New York City. And so for me, I felt that after so many years of kind of being silent about my identities in order to survive, I felt it was necessary to, you know, kind of be live very truth. honest. Yeah, to yeah. live my truth just completely blatantly and openly. And it made me uncomfortable as much as it made other people uncomfortable, but I felt it was the work that I needed to do in order to, I think, free so many young women who are kind of grappling with their identities and themselves. You had a lot of freedom as a child, too. I did, Cause well, because I grew up in Hawaii. Right. And so- Hawaii? There, yeah, there was, yeah, well, my dad was in the military. He's from Dallas, Texas. Did you know Barack? I did not, no. He was the only black guy I know from Hawaii. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> well, he, well, he went to like one of the top schools you can go to in the country, period, like a prep school. And so I went to a school in like, you know, that had public housing and that was low income. The hood. Yeah, basically. Okay. And so my, my dad met my mom, who's Native Hawaiian, and that's how they made me and my brother Chad, and I have, you know, three other siblings. But, um, yeah, so, but, yeah, Hawaii does have an openness to, mm -hmm. to gender identity. And also, like, it's very multicultural. There's a lot of different, you know, religions, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different races there. And so I think that there is just, like, an overwhelming openness to allow people to kind of just be themselves. I don't know if there was acceptance, but at the bottom level, there was at least tolerance. I wasn't ever afraid of um, of being trans there. I haven't got the chance to read the book yet, but at what point did you start identifying as a woman? I think when I was, like, maybe, like, six years old, I started vocalizing just, like, in a very basic way around gender, like, wanting to play with girls things and not really how old are you now i'm 34. 34 okay yeah and so when i was about six and then maybe around 12 was when i told my parents that mm -hmm. i felt as if something was different than me and it was more than just liking being attracted to boys it had to be more it was more about my own identity and so it was around 13 14 that i began transitioning basically and, and i'm so sure they knew already well, I think my father, we had a lot of battles growing up. You know, my dad was a military man. He was a black man from the South. You know, he didn't know anything about any of these things. And so my number one person that I probably butted heads with, and I'm also very much like, because my father's very much about being real, about the realness, and we butted heads a lot because of the way in which I, 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 I just was. And he didn't feel comfortable with that. Did they try to pray it out of you? That's some of the things that they said. Pray it I out got, of you. I got really lucky that I did not have parents <laughs> that were super religious. Okay. Um, and I also had, you know, aunties and, grand, and, and grandmothers who were super like, you know, let this kid just be. Like, we can't, we can't just, we can't force this kid to be anything other than what he is mm -hmm. at the time, right? And so, like femininity to them wasn't something that they had to beat out of me in a sense, but my father definitely, he was the one that took it upon himself to be like, my son needs to be like my brother Chad. A man, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. needs to be a man. And so yeah. that was a lot of our struggles growing up was about that kind of, you know, me being feminine, me being myself and him being like, I'm scared that my child is like this and what will the world do mm -hmm. with me having a kid like this? So right. my job as a father is to protect my kid. And what he did was try to correct me. He tried to get me out there with the football. He tried to get right. me out there with the basketball. He tried to get me out there wrestling with my brother, Chad. And it just wasn't what I was interested in doing. I did it make you rebel more? Not rebel, but like... I think in my father's telling of it, yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like to him, anything that I did was like this, you know, fight against him. He sees me as a very vocal child. I don't remember being vocal or ever talking back to my dad. 
But there definitely were times when I was just like, can I be me? Mm-hmm. And a lot of our battles came around my hair because I have like this really big curly hair. And he. Never real? Yeah. He used to be what like. What you got right now is real. No, this is a ponytail. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I was about to call you a liar. <laughs> no, he said, no, I'm about to give you This is real. <laughs> this is real. Um, yeah, and so we. Um, yeah, so we had a lot of battles around that, but he, you about know. About your hair, because he wanted you to cut your hair. And you yeah, he, he would, the way he would punish me would be like, he loved my hair the way it was. Like, I had pretty hair, whatnot, good hair, quote unquote. And so he would let me wear my hair long when I was little. And then any time that I would do something, he'd be like, I'm going to cut your goddamn hair. <laughs> and so that was always the threat that would always get me back in line to, like, you know, kind of cover up who I was and cover up the way that I acted. That's got to be a hard conversation to have because... Mm-hmm. I always say, you know, when you talk about phobia, it's just people have a fear of what they don't understand. Yeah. So it might it had to be a difficult conversation to have with your father because you probably still didn't quite understand it either. God, I had no language. I had yeah. no words. I didn't grow up in a culture or in a time period like a lot of young people are growing up now where you saw trans people on TV or on that's a why radio I asked your show. age because, I mean, it, yeah. you said at six. I mean, I couldn't imagine when we were six... Nobody was ever talking about it, and if they were, they would be mm-hmm. so fearful of coming out. Oh, I yeah. definitely wanted to be a werewolf when I was six. I tell you all that story all the time. I <laughs> How did that work out? I mean, I don't know. Male werewolf or female werewolf? It werewolf. was Teen Wolf. Teen <laughs> oh, Wolf teen got wolf. me. <laughs> but yeah. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah, and so for me, there was like, it's hard to, it's hard to be something that you can't see, mm-hmm. right? And so for me, that was always the difficult part of, of existing as a young person, especially, like, I didn't see any black trans women. Right anywhere in media you know there there may be some semblances like here and there of mm-hmm. like white trans folk around and there was like it seems like there's an acceptance or an openness to talking about it but within communities of color I, I never saw anyone like me or like my sisters that are now able to do the things that that we're doing in media and so I I hope that what it does is that it empowers a lot of young girls growing up to see that they don't have to only work the stroll, that they don't only have to be in strip clubs, that they don't not only have to be someone um, that's kind of hidden in some man's, you know, arsenal of, right. of thoughts or whatnot. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, you know, and so I hope that what we can do is hopefully expand the possibilities for specifically black trans girls. When did you learn the language? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. please, yeah. yeah. When, did you, when did you learn the language? Like, what did you see? Oh, or who did you see that made you be like, this is what I am? The lang- it probably would be my best friend, Wendy. So at 12 years old, the reason why that was such a good <laughs> what? We okay. both thought Williams. Wendy, I know. Wendy, Wendy, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we both thought Wendy Williams. You guys. Well, you used to work with her, right? I did, I we, did, we were, I did. We worked yeah, yeah, yeah. with each other. Um, yeah, my best friend, Wendy. We were both in the seventh grade, and she came up to me one day in at the playground and was just like, I see you, you need to stop pretending. And mm-hmm. then we became best friends from that space. And so- She's trans but, too? Yeah, she's trans. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, but the thing is, we didn't like use language like that. Like a lot of this language comes out of the academy, comes out of colleges, comes out of gender and sexual studies courses. And so it's difficult sometimes to just speak it plain because it comes out of a space that oftentimes a lot of folk from of color don't have access to, right? And so like the language piece becomes this really difficult space of struggle where people feel as if they don't want to talk about these issues at all, even though they see black and Latina trans girls, Mm -hmm. they don't want to talk about these issues because they don't feel like they have the right language. If they say the wrong thing, specifically if you're a public figure, that then it pushes you out and people are just like, you're being being super problematic, I can't talk to you, like, and then so then what happens is that people are like, I'm not touching that. Right, we've had that issue up here. Yeah, that makes it a problem mm because we honestly don't know and like you said, I I don't have a transgender in my family to Mm -hmm. ask, but I don't have gender transgenders in my life to ask. Right. You know so what I know, I, so I, you... I know quite a few, so it's been something yeah. that, like, I I think what it is is when you know somebody and you know their journey and you get to speak to them, because sometimes you just look at things and it's just what you see on TV yeah. right. or what you see, like, portrayed a certain way. So it's hard for people to Like, like the word yeah, tranny. Yeah. Why is tranny a bad word to say for a transgender? Why is that... You know? Well, even in you know in the trans community too, the term tranny is one that's even contentious within the community, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like say nigger or something, right? It's so like there's some trans women who are completely fine, right? With and they say the it because they use it amongst mm-hmm. themselves, gotcha. right? But there's something when someone outside of that experience use that term a lot terminology, it comes off as more of an epithet than it gotcha. is about a bringing in or like a it's supposed to have a term. negative kind of yeah. Because it rhymes yeah, yeah, with yeah, granny, yeah. and like I ain't no old bitch. <laughs> like, don't <do> <laughs> hey, don't be ageist. <laughs> Don't so what, made you, what made you want to become a transgender opposed to being like a gay male? Like what mm. made you say, I want to go question. that way? 
Well, I think that being a, you know, a, a, a trans woman for me, it was more about who I felt I was versus who I felt I was attracted to. And so what happens oftentimes is there's a conflation and a mix up between sexual orientation, meaning who you go to bed with mm-hmm. and gender identity, meaning who you go to bed as. Mm-hmm. And so that's the distinction between the two. And so for me, it wasn't about, you know, the sense of like feeling I was attracted to men or being attracted to masculinity. It was about my own embodiment and how I wanted to show up, not just in the bed, but also in the world. Like See, I am a woman. I'm yeah. a girl. When you were young, it was like, I'm a girl. I like to play with Yeah, girls. and it, like- it was before I even had any consciousness of sexuality. I didn't mm-hmm. know about you know, one, I wasn't thinking about like, I like wearing dresses. And... Yeah. Yeah. That, that kind of like little basic everyday stuff. And sometimes it was as simple as like wanting to sit in the library and read books or like wanting to sit in a corner reading books or just being quiet. And for my father, it was like, no, you need to go outside and play. You need right. to go do something right. active because that's what boys do in the world. But you so actually something. had the whole surgery, though. I did. I did. I had it as a teenager, um, which I was really. really, That's a a hell of a commitment. As a teenager? Well, that's not the surgery. Um, Oh, it it seems that it sounds like. We say surgery. Well, we don't know. We don't know. That's the first thing. Yeah, I had had bottom surgery as a young person, which I do um, detail Mm -hmm. in every um, aspect of my first book, Redefining Realness, which largely is about my teenage transition and transitioning as a young person. You know, I never had access to a book at the time. The reason why that book, I think, did so well was that there was never one written by a person of color and there was never one written by someone that was actually young going through the experience. Because you go through, you know, if you're 40-something years old and you're going through that experience, there's different struggles, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're a teenager going through that experience, growing up in communities of color that are already low resource, growing up with single parents and all this kind of stuff, you have there's different aspects and hurdles that you have to climb in order to just be yourself. And so for me, the first thing I learned about myself um, in the world when I came into the world as my parents' child was that I was poor and black in America. The Mm. transness stuff came after. Right. And so I think that what's really difficult for I know a lot of girls who listen to this show and who live for this Mm -hmm. show and live for hip hop and and the culture and all that stuff, that they're a part of these communities. They're a part of our communities, but then they're separated because of the trans stuff. But at the end of the day, there's still black people living in America. Absolutely. Right. And so I think that there is something that there's some healing that we have to do as a community, specifically folk who have access like you all and who have a platform is to bring folk in and have these conversations and talk about language and then be bold enough and courageous enough to have difficult conversations about difference. And speaking across difference is something that even black folk have to do amongst each other Mm -hmm. in order to evolve, in order to grow and in order to ensure that we don't have a 16th black trans woman being killed. Gotcha. In another year. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I, I did a special once with MTV called, um, I don't remember what it was called at the time, but it was like we were talking about police brutality mm-hmm. and, you know, Black Lives Matter. And it was a black trans uh, woman there. And she was like, well, we don't feel included. And, you know, uh, why aren't we talking about the black transgenders? Our lives matter too. And I'm like, it's Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Like, it's all inclusive. Like, I'm yeah. not excluding the transgenders. And the folks who started Black Lives Matter are, you know, are three black queer women mm-hmm. who are actually really intersectional and they're inclusive of black trans women's oh, experiences. I didn't know that. They know, yeah, and black trans folk and black queer folk. And so like the platform, if you go to the Black Lives Matter platform, it's there. It now, says I, I it thought explicitly. You say, I thought queer was, was, was disrespectful. I thought you couldn't say queer. It's a term that's been reclaimed by a lot of queer folk. Yeah. <laughs> what did that even mean? I know. Lang- I told you language I, is strong. Like I see it as the LGBTQ, but what did that even mean? Like what yeah. is that? <laughs> Like, the, well, there's yeah, there's like LGBTQIA, right? So there's there's a lot. I just learned about the YA. <laughs> I just learned about the YA actually. So it's like you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersexed, and and allies, and asexual. It's a lot. So you don't it's consider yourself gay. You're not gay. I don't know, but I. How is she I, gay I, when she identifies I'm just, as a I'm woman? Saying she doesn't. She's not gay. Yeah. She doesn't consider. But I, I identify. Right. I think my politics are. I have a queer I, politics because all of the people who came before me, whose work that I read, the work mm-hmm. that I, that really informed me, were queer folk. There's Bayard Rustin. Mm-hmm. There's James Baldwin. There's Audre Lorde. There's um, Barbara Smith, and so so many of them really um, activated me and raised my political consciousness as a young person, which then enabled me to do the work that I do and try to educate and um, inspire. Folk. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about this book, Surpassing Certainty, for a bit, because I know the guys haven't read it yet, so I won't give away too much. But this is about your life in your 20s, mm-hmm. about being in Hawaii. And I like that you detail the part about working in a strip club, and then you mm-hmm. talk about Chris Rock and how yeah, you felt yeah. like his jokes 
It's funny, but it's a little bit offensive because he says one of the main jobs as a father is keeping your daughter off that pole. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't succeeded at that, then you failed as a father. Mm -hmm. Now, reading your description about working in the strip club, it made you see it like I think differently people have this perception of women who work as strippers and what it is that they're doing and what's going on in there but really like you detail how you're not supposed to sleep with any of the men in the club mm. you know it really is just a job that you were going to to get some money but mind you all yeah. fathers I would say not all but 85% of fathers feel like that like their main mm. goal is to make sure their daughter's not on the strip that's it I want to keep my daughter off any Mona Scott Young show and the script, the script, the script <laughs> but then if your daughter could turn out as excellent as Janet Mock wouldn't well, you it, say you know, part you of that journey? I, I did for a little while. I gotta read this goddamn book. <laughs> 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 Are you listening? No. <laughs> this guy is crazy. That whole part. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I, can, I can understand that, but I think that where we see it as a failing is that we look at women's lives as a reflection of their fathers, mm -hmm. right? And so we we then strip young women of choice. Right of no of giving them agency to be able to or respecting their agency to say that this is my body and I'm engaging in this space with my body to take care of myself specifically as a low income girl of color who doesn't have access. Your daughters will likely be fine, right? But like girls from the hood who don't have fathers, girls from the hood whose right. mothers are single mothers, why should we be shaming them mm -hmm. when they're using the one resource that they have, their body, to take care of themselves in the world? And so for me, it's about releasing ourselves from the respectability politics, number one, which was really great in the 60s, right? Having those images of respectable black people dressed up with the collars being attacked by dogs and police animals, right? Like that kind of stuff makes sense. Like that image is strong. But now I think that our generation will have to release ourselves from the respectability politics that I think is wrapped up in the Chris Rock um, bit about that funny as hell, mm -hmm. really insightful. But at the same time, I think it also then shames a lot of women who felt as if the the pole or the stage was their only choice to be able to take. I, I like I look at it as a like scrippers is like selling dope, and I explain why. You're not supposed to sell dope forever. There's mm -hmm. a lot of brothers that come in, they want to sell dope, get a little bit of money to do something else. And I see I know a lot of women that have done that. Like mm -hmm. I know women who have script, pay their way through school, and yeah. now they're like respectable. I don't want to say respectable, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean. People that have professions, like actual <clears throat> career. Yeah. So that's how I look at it. Yeah, I think it's a part of the hustle, right? Like it's a way to make a way when there's no way but made for you. But it's interesting because you had a, even another layer of struggle within mm -hmm. that because you were always concerned about people that you knew, you know, spotting you in the club mm -hmm. and just trying to kind of put you on blast. I was going to yeah. ask, did you strip, did you have the surgery after or before when you before. started stripping? Yeah. So, okay, so you had boobs. Because Hawaii was a completely nude. Hawaii, Hawaii was nude. Yeah, nude. nude. So you had nude bottom nude too? Yep. So wow. you think she was out there as a man in a woman's <laughs> script club on the pole? Dance. I didn't know it was nude. I didn't know because in New Jersey. Well, sometimes you, you, have the, you wear a bikini. Yeah, you just go topless. Yeah. yeah. Is it oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so okay, you okay. could, so in theory, you could, you, you could, could like talk. not have bottom surgery and still dance in a, in oh, a lot breasts, of states. You know what I mean? Because you yeah. could have. Yeah. When'd you get those? Those are nice. I'm gonna be honest. Like, I, I got, I got, you walked in the room and I was like, she, I, I was just, like, here. I, this is what I was. I was prepping no, myself I for this. I was I like, said, here we go. I, I gotta get ready for good. this. Did question. I say that? I was like, y'all like, she look good. He said, he said, so, he he look good. Nah, I didn't say all that. I'm married. But when did when did you get? When did this get done? I had, I had it all done when as a what, teenager. What did when did it get done? I don't as okay, soon as it was college. legally possible from a doctor's standpoint to be able to have the surgeries I wanted, I was I was ready to have them. Most people don't even know what college they want to go to. How yeah, do you decide I knew that you too. want to? Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that we are multiplicities. We can carry all of the, we can juggle all of these different desires and plans for ourselves. I now, just knew. I knew that. I just knew at a young age. And also, gotcha. like, again, growing up in Hawaii, there were tons of trans women in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so there's like an openness in that space. Just like there's tons of trans girls here in New York City. New York City. Like, yeah, it's, one of, it's one of the meccas, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, in that sense, I was able to tap into a network of women who had already created and paved a way for themselves. And I was able to be like, oh, so she did this and she went here for that and she got the money to do that by doing this. And then I was plotting in my mind. I have always been like that. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this X, Y, Z so that by 18, when I go to college, I don't have to worry about my body stuff. And person, I can concentrate right? Whole new as, yeah, I can concentrate on what's up here and so. what I wanna create in the world beyond just my body stuff. And even then, being in a relationship, like, so then we saw you meet a guy in a club. I did. Right? In the you, strip club. In the strip yeah. club. And you guys were dating for real. Like, you went home with him and stayed there for days and didn't even want to go back. You were in love. And this was kind Kinda, of the yeah, first yeah. time this had... Falling in love. Did yeah. he yeah. know that you originally... Uh, he did not know, well, right. initially. So... Do you feel the need to tell people? I did. I did. I did feel the need to tell him. And so, like, once 
it became serious and I knew that this was going to go somewhere, I was like, I got to tell him. So then I told him. And what did he say? What was his, how was that conversation? In his reaction, he was confused. He was just like, so he didn't really ask, what are you saying? Because I was super vague about it too, because I wasn't comfortable. I was mm -hmm. too, she was I was like, 19 I can't years have old. Kids. I was like, I think what, yeah, what I first said was like, I can't have kids, number one. I can't have kids because I had a surgery when I was 18 years old and I had a surgery at 18 years old because I was, you know, born a boy. And he was just like processing. Was processing, he high? Processing, yeah, that would have confused When did you tell him? That, that he was in the military, too. so he couldn't, he okay, couldn't, gotcha, he couldn't gotcha. smoke or do anything but like that. But by that time, you guys were already in kind of deep. Kind of like it was like a month bit. in, yeah. We had had sex. We had been shacking up. I thought initially that he was going to be moving away because we were. Was his we were. Plan. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got questions. I know. Yeah. You said you had sex, mm -hmm. right? Explain because you don't have what your explain with sex is. I'm explaining. Your body can't naturally get wet as a man, right? How you know? You what? Know, you should asking, ask the that's what I'm asking. You're yeah. talking about ancient surgeries. This 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 stuff has changed. Oh, tell me. This stuff has changed. I'm not a doctor, so okay. this this is above my pay grade to be talking about. But from my <laughs> own experience and from the girls that I know, things have shifted a lot. So now they women could get wet. I hope from so. Surgery. Yeah, I think it'd be pretty tragic if you if you. You could always couldn't. use lubricant too, by the way. But even yeah, if you, you know, naturally. And sometimes you have to when a guy's not turning you on. You have to just do it for a hustle or something. Right. Or even if you were doing anal, you got to use lubricant. So you have a clit too. Oh God. This is getting... <laughs> This is get, this is getting too deep. Do I have to read deep. the book? Or what I yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can, but there's also you can like Google this stuff. Right. It's like right there. Like you can look at surgeries. They're online. People have done them on camera. You know, Tyra Banks even had it on her show before. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the surgery's well documented. Okay, I'm so sorry. So what happened with the guy? The guy you you and the guy had sex. You told mm -hmm. him you used to be a, a a man, and then what? Well, I was never a man. Boy. Right. Um, my experience is quite different because I was young. I started trying. I started puberty at the same time. I Peers started puberty. Gotcha. That my puberty was assisted by a doctor, right? So that I had to have cross hormone therapy, um, and so yeah, we we talked about it. Um, he was he had some questions. I answered them. Um, he asked me why I didn't feel safe enough to tell him. I said I just didn't feel safe enough to tell you. And I also didn't think that this was anything. I thought that this would be like some like summer fling, and right? Then you'd move, he he you'd move away, right? Yeah, you'd it. move away, and then that be that be it. And so for me, I was so also protective of my um, my story too. And I also was uncomfortable, I was 18 years old. Right. And so it was a different time. Um, with my husband now, you know, I told him within three weeks before we even had sex. And plus, when somebody Googles you now, I mean. Oh, well, yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah, like it's if not... I have to be single again, I, I don't know what. How long have you been married? How long have you been married? Plus, I don't know how, um, since no, um, 2015. Okay. I think it's important to do that though, because you, like a guy could be questioning, questioning his sexuality. Mm. If he's been with you, then you tell him after the fact, and he's like, well, I, I liked it. Like, I really mm -hmm. liked it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think yeah. that could confuse a, a guy. So I think it's important to tell yeah. him. Yeah, and I think that, you know, when you're in any, any kind of, like, intimate relationship, a part of being in a relationship is steadily sharing and shedding part of your layers and, and sharing that with mm -hmm. another person. And so I think that anyone that's dating and hopefully hoping to build something, you have to be able to be honest about where you've been and who you are and, and all that stuff. Did the original guy break up with you? What happened? Are you, are you we wanna, no, you we dated... Well, yeah, but we dated for like five years. He was like my first. So he, he stuck first, around. He was my first love, my first wow. partner. Yeah. Why'd y'all break up? Because it just, <laughs> we met when I was 19 and I had grown and he had grown and we wanted different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know. I think uh, conversation is the, the key to end all phobia. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that people always say phobia is a fear. It's like, well, I'm not, I'm not afraid of a gay person. I'm not afraid of a transgender mm -hmm. person. But people do fear what they don't understand. Yeah. So I think you have to have conversations to come to a better mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Caitlyn Jenner, and has she helped the transgender world? Terrible face for y'all, by the way. I'm beyond. Well, you, you that, interviewed they, her for the trans. Well, I think that black and Latino girls would say that that's not our face. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And so I think <laughs> that right. there's also there's also divisions within our own communities about these. Um, these issues and who we say is out there speaking up front for us. You know, for me, um, I was a girl that grew up with the girls. And, like, we we wouldn't say that Caitlyn was someone that represents us. I do think that she, what her work has done is that because the Kardashians are a global thing and because right. she also as herself when she was presenting as Bruce as an Olympian, she was an American hero to a certain generation. And so mm -hmm. she spoke across generations and she spoke across global lines and boundaries. And so when her story went out there, her visibility pushed people, specifically media gatekeepers, to talk about this issue. They could not ignore it anymore. Right. Right. Because the Kardashians are a global phenomenon that you can't ignore. And so in that sense, I think that she has done a phenomenal job in terms of breaking through barriers and enabling us to be seen and heard. 
Now, her politics are a whole nother thing, but that's Caitlyn Jenner, the person, Mm -hmm. right? And so the person is problematic as fuck. And the person, (laughs) the person has to be checked because you can't, you can't have, you know, trans women of color and low income trans folk on your show and talking about their struggles without linking it to the sociopolitical landscape of conservatives who don't want to give social safety nets and, and resources to poor people, to queer and trans people, to folk of color. And so for me, there's that there seems to be like a disconnect between how she sees herself in the world as a trans person and then how she also has lived her life for a long time as a very privileged very white true. person. Did you see the homie uh, Amanda Seals? Check him. I did, and that was a Check beautiful her. moment. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was a beautiful moment to have that conversation and be like, they're not here for you. And I don't know why. And so I think that even that space right there between two women who come at their womanhood from completely different experiences, one is a woman of color, one is... Um, white, one is, you know, cisgender, one is transgender, one is super fucking rich, and one is on the come up, right? Like, there's like all that stuff there. And even they, as these people who are having this conversation in this space, are speaking across difference in ways that I think a lot of black folk were able to see that and be like, yeah, so why are you all having Caitlyn speak for you all? And I'm like, uh, we didn't choose her. Yeah. She mm-hmm. is a person with an mm-hmm. experience and a platform and folk that have enable her to be seen and heard on, on very, many various levels. Does now, it ever he, get frustrated? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, one heated debate that we had in here was about bathrooms. Because mm. we were talking in here about being able to choose what bathroom according to what gender you identify with. And I feel like people should be able to do that. But they were concerned about whether or not people would take advantage about your daughter I, being I, in I the can, I, can, I, can, I can say it quite plain because mm-hmm. you're here. If they look like you, uh, I'm fine with it. No, if they, but if yeah. it's just a guy walking in saying he identifies that, that's as a the thing, woman, because I think you give no. people, a, you know, you give somebody could be a pervert and say I identify as a woman today yes. and do something if my daughter's in the bathroom. But I think if they're true and they're honest and this is really them, then I have no problem with it. But anybody mm-hmm. could just walk into any bathroom they want in that case. We're just talking about legally if you identify as a woman. If someone's really a pervert and they're going to walk in the bathroom, it doesn't matter what the law is, I would think. I'm just saying, I, well, I, I think it's very rare for. Yeah, where this is actually happening, if we, if we were to really break down where this is happening, it's happening in schools. Mm-hmm. And so kids are not sexually abusing other kids in school. That's not happening. What they're doing is using images of folk who are not able, trans folk who are not able to pass and saying that they're going to come in and get your daughters. Mm-hmm. And that's really dangerous because what it does is it separates trans youth from other youth in schools. Young people get it. Like when I was in school, my peers were not checking for me in the restroom. It was vice principals. It was adults who didn't want me in that space because they thought it was weird that my classmates were, were there with me and wanting, wanting me to be in that space with them. Mm-hmm. It's about equal access to public spaces. Every civil rights issue, well, not civil rights issue, every social justice issue has gone to the bathrooms in some sense. You think about black folks in the 60s, you think about during segregation, you think about um, women in the workplace, you think about disabled mm. folk. It has always gone back to the bathrooms because it's one of those universal experiences that we all have we to all deal with. Use it. We all have <laughs> to have access to. And eventually we'll work this out to the point where I think that we'll have more single stall restrooms for folk to be able to have access to that are not gender, that are not sexed in some way based on genitals. Natural instinct is a father, though. If I see a guy walking to the woman's bathroom, I'm going to naturally be like, yo, what's up? What's going on? You know what I'm saying? And like, that's, that's, I think that's the experience of, you know, this stuff is already self-policed. I don't think the government needs to come in and try to um, create these blanket statement right. patchwork of laws in every single state. Because what's happening is that it's not a federal issue. It's right. a state by state issue. And so in some conservative states, these are happening more overwhelmingly than in other states. In New York City, it's not an issue. Right. There's trans folk who look all kinds of ways, who have access to the restrooms, and people work it out amongst themselves. Absolutely. And oftentimes yes. what happens is that there are those difficult conversations, like you just said, that are happening in these spaces, and people work it out, and it is uncomfortable. But that's a part of where legislation doesn't necessarily keep up with culture and the way in which people actually live. Yeah, because I'm and from so- South Carolina, and I've never seen that. So, I, so yeah. it's just like, when did that become an issue? That's what I thought. When I first heard about it, I was like, well, when did this start becoming it's an be, issue? It's being created into an issue because marriage for the LGBT, quote unquote, mainstream agenda is that marriage pass and it's the law of the land. And then they needed to create another issue that's a non-issue that people have been working on and living through forever. Right. And they created it into an right. issue. And so then what it does, it distracts from the actual issues that are going on where it's like talking about poverty and homelessness and a lack of education that's happening for a lot of trans youth, specifically trans youth of color that people, no one's talking about. Does it ever get frustrating because it has to come a point, like even when I talk about having conversations where we have to talk and come to an understanding, does it ever make you feel like, 
I don't gotta make you understand shit. Most, <laughs> most in my everyday life, that's how I feel. But the work that I'm committed mm -hmm. to doing is having these difficult conversations. But I want to understand because yeah. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to offend somebody. Just like if you have a, a, a white neighbor that might not understand why things bother you. It's, I don't it's, care what the white people think. Oh, what you mean? You know, it's, it's not a matter of them. They you might want to explain to them because they might not know, so they might have oh, questions. Oh, got you, got you. Do you, you know, like, do you know how many people yeah, that are listening to Janet right now Absolutely. are like, okay, I get it now. You explained a lot of things. So I got a lot. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. You explained a lot of things that it, some people might not have understood before, and I think that's really important. And it's also great for people who are struggling with their own identity mm. and to have somebody that can be a spokesperson that's gone through the things that you've gone through and been so successful. I mean, working at some of my favorite magazines, mm. you know, writing for people, being mm. down with Oprah, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, HBO, you and you're doing a trans list and all of that. So I think that is um, excellent for people to see. Don't Absolutely. breeze by that down with Oprah thing now. You down, you <laughs> down with Oprah? <laughs> She's down with Oprah. <laughs> you mean you're down with Oprah? <laughs> well, she interviewed me when my first book came okay. out. Okay. For right. Super Soul Sunday. And so we have a um, a connection. And what, are y'all cool? Mm -hmm. Like y'all still kick it now? <laughs> You're so jealous. Don't be jealous. I, I, I I'm signed a Pinkett, My last name is Pinkett Smith Winfrey Knowles Carter. I've never <laughs> met Oprah, so I'm jealous of anybody who's met Oprah. Yeah, she's a she's amazing. You know, she's a really great mentor and a, a guide for me. And when does the book come out? The book came out um, just last month. Last mm -hmm. month, the book came yeah. out. Okay, yeah, so surpassing certainty. So listen. I have it. I'm going to read it. Yeah, so this is part oh, of my book you. club. So I you all would probably book. actually enjoy the first book. I'll have them send it here. Oh, yeah. Please. This is her What's the first one, one called? Redefining Realness. Redefining Realness. Damn, right there. Okay. But I think this is going to be a great book for everybody to read. A lot of information. You have a great, interesting story, you know, so appreciate it. Well, thank you for thank joining you for us. Thank you all us. for having we me. I really, really appreciate it. Miss Janet Mock. Janet Mock. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. 